Hello and welcome to the i3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography here at the School of Visual Arts. I am Julie Graham. I am happy to bring you my old pal, Angela Capetta. Uh, she and I started working together in the early 90s in the editorial world. I was her first agent when she was shooting Famous Faces and I clearly remember when she began documenting weddings and how she was making photos that people were not used to seeing. In other words, real pictures of the big day, black and white, up close and personal, imperfections included. Angela has by now photographed weddings all over the globe. We'll hear about Angela's wedding work and personal photography tonight, but a note that her editorial clients include The New Yorker, Refinery29, Vice, Wired, New York Magazine, The Cut, GQ, Harper's Bazaar, the New York and London Times magazines, Travel and Leisure, and Vogue. Her advertising clients also include Arnold Worldwide, BBDO, and Saatchi. Angela's work is collected in the New York Public Library, the Smithsonian, and the London Victoria and Albert Museum. Thank you, Angela. You're welcome. Hi, everybody. I'm Angela Capetta, and um, thank you, Julie. All right, so I guess let's do this. That's me. Um, the first body of work I'll show you is called Glendalise, The Life and World of a Youngest Daughter. The book is coming out on La Tierra uh, any month now. They say it'll ship in September. I'll believe it when I see it. So here is, um, I'm going to show you this body of work. It's about a family. I was in the, we lived in the same neighborhood. And I'm also the youngest daughter within a large family. So. The whole neighborhood was on the edge of gentrification in the, in the 90s, as you can imagine. And this body of work is about how a family lives in um, you know, a certain neighborhood on the edge of a certain precipice. And eventually, the nucleus of the story became the youngest daughter, and the project took her name. So I'll just, uh, I'll just get started. And uh, I may interject here and there. I'm, they're mostly six by nine uh, film, Fuji Riala, Kodak. I would go to the different apartments within the neighborhood where the family lived and the extended family. There used to be these open fields on the Lower East Side. And the men in the families would put these sheds up and they would just sort of go in the sheds and like drink and smoke and listen to the game and occasionally the, the kids were allowed in but then that, you know, that was the beginning and the end of it. And then as you know there are these little gardens. That's a quinceanera. This picture is called World Trade Center. Can you see it? Sweet 16. This was the girls' room. That's uh, one of the buildings on, I want to say that one's on Avenue D. Apartment buildings are a big part of this project. Rivington Street. This is the cousin section of the project. I use a lot of flash. Um, I've designed my own flash. Uh, I carry it everywhere. My chiropractor is very happy about that. <laughs> There's a bit of panoramic format. When uh, I had two six by nine cameras, and they were great, but sometimes they would fail and they would need to be sent out to be repaired. And whenever they were out, I would need to switch formats. So I would use a different, I would just grab whatever I had and it would be either, you know, a 35 mil with a Leica or a, a panorama.
Can you speak a little more about how you met Glenn? Yeah, we were neighbors. I mean, it's nothing really that complicated. We lived in this on the, within a few blocks of each other, and I would see them around. And they were, you know, they were very nice. And then she took that one of me. And then there's a little bit of, uh, this is the New Yorker article. Uh, the New Yorker picked it up and ran a, um, a profile of me vis-a-vis -vis this body of work. And then um, that's the book cover. So that's that body of work. How did Brother Love end up in the book? Oh, how did I get the book? It's a very big question. Um, so I'm going to reduce it down. So the book, I was in the New Yorker, and um, the phone started ringing. And I got um, some offers from some publishers, and I vetted them. And I initially went with one publisher, and um, it didn't quite work out. And then I moved on to uh, the publisher I'm currently with, and it's been a very amazing process. I didn't really realize how collaborative it would be. And there's a publisher and a designer, and then there's me, and everybody wants what they want. and it, there's a, you know, a lot of this, and, and there's also just, a, you get these ideas that you never would have had if you hadn't have collaborated in, in, in the first place. So, for example, the book opens, the, the hinge is on the top, and it, that took a lot of convincing. I just wanted a regular book you know, that opened like a normal book, and they, they convinced me to do this, and I just said, sure, why not? So, that's why it looks like that. But it's going to have, a, the back is, is designed, this is a, I got this slide from them a, f a few days before the initial, the initial rollout of the final one, so it's a little surprise. You're going to have to wait to see it. So yeah, they're in Italy, and the, de designer, the designer is in Paris, and I'm here, so a lot of Zooms at weird times, and I'm going to Italy for my press checks in July, and um, yeah, and it premieres at Perry Photo in November, and, and that's it. It's going to have a soft launch at the ICP Book Fair in September. But the official launch will be at Perry Photo in November. So if you're there, come on by and uh, say hello. So um, I'll move on to the. Wait, I yeah. Have a yeah. Sure. So like how oh, long? Okay, hold on, hold on. Uh, it's a ten-year body of work. Uh, ten years. Okay. Yeah. And did the family were they curious? Did they want to see photos? Like what was that kind of? I mean, relationship they were like? really into it. They were just like, okay, here's Angela again. But I would show up with a sack of darkroom prints and just give them away because I guess that's what you do. So it wouldn't really occur to me not to do that. No matter where I photographed, um, I would always bring a stack of prints eventually at some point to give as a you know a thank you or a courtesy. And um, otherwise, what's the point in having a darkroom? And are, are they, wh oh wait, how do they feel about the book? And are you still I, You know, I, I, it's not really their thing. But I mean, th some people aren't really into art photography. They're just like, whatever, Angela's doing this thing, and here she is again. And they just eventually got used to me being there. I mean, y you know, it's when I want to shoot something, just get out of my way. So it's, it was just kind of organic, and they didn't really have any problem with it. It was kind of a lovely experience because it was, um, uh, you know, looking at a family and kind of seeing my own family through this family. So that was the kind of long and the short of it. <laughs> All right, so um, shall I move on to the next one, Julie? Sure. All right, so this next body of work is called, it's called We Are Gathered Here, and it's documentary style wedding photography. And I get hired and I go shoot weddings and this is what I come away with, so I'll, I'll start. <laughs> I do tend to fetishize fabric a bit. It's just when the light hits it, it's the flash hits it, and poof, it just explodes and becomes this whole other thing, and I just think it's cool. She actually made this dress, and she made every single bridesmaid's dress. And these are also, I would say, mostly six by nine. And um, again, flash and Tri-X, um, you know, 120, and that's 35 mil.
So a lot of my clients do micro weddings and they just do super beautiful, you know, kind of lovely, tiny, tiny little wedding. They still go all day long, but they're just, you know, a different take on it. This was a wedding in a parking space. The couple met in a parking space. I think one of them was trying to get their car in and the other one was trying to get their car in and three years later they got married in the parking space. <laughs> it was kind of cute actually. So, and then when they got married in the parking space they put, <laughs> they put coins in the meter <laughs> and they put a bow on it. It was really great. Yeah, I, I can't explain a lot of these. <laughs> yeah, you do <laughs> with the, oh, with the, the the in the background the the f wiping up the yeah, yeah again you got to just just accept it as an inevitability. <laughs> I know, I know. I know. How cute is he? Could you die? Again, I don't know. I don't know what to, I don't know how to explain that. <laughs> I I really do love shooting into impossible light. If it's if it's difficult and if it's a challenge and if I can't do it, then I just want to do it even more. So I just blasted the back of that as with that. You can see that there's if if you know if you notice it, there's a spotlight in front of her and I just, you can see every single inch of the veil. It doesn't disappear at all. That's, that's me. Just in case you're wondering. I really like to shoot in cars too. It's kind of strange but also kind of predictable the way the light behaves. This is actually the, the first wedding I ever got paid to shoot. I killed it. That's a few weeks ago in the park. And then the panoramic will come into, um, into play as well. If uh, a client wants to do a film package, um, you know, I, I will s see if they're into this. And if they say yes, then, then I shoot it. Okay, and there's a little career porn. And uh, you have to tell us more about that. All right. Well, I can't. I don't, my agent. I, I mean, I hate to sound like a, a jerk, but I know how this sounds. But my agent did this. So I mean, it was a picture I took, and it was in my body of work. And Delta saw it, and here we are. <coughs> Kaching. That's all I cared about. And um, and then this was my picture on the big TV in Times Square. Yeah, I you know them. That's so funny. I was at that wedding. You were not. I was. Shut up. That means I have your picture. That means I took a pic, many pictures of you. So yeah, that's my picture on the big TV in Times Square. We'll, we'll get you after, don't worry. Yeah. Julie, make sure she, wedding. yeah, I know, it was great. And um, okay, so then there's this next part of my brain where I, I have these days, I call them mental health days, where I just go to a dog park and I just shoot people with their dogs. It's really funny, it's very sweet, I get a kick out of it, and it's really just so my brain can just kind of relax. Because some people will say, do you want to hold him? And I'm like, yes, and then I hold the puppy and it's great. <laughs> so after you've had a, you know, a certain kind of week, you need a little, you know, a little uh, no priority type of shooting, at least I do. So here we go, I kind of love it when the dogs look like the people. I always looked like my dogs. We always had dogs that looked like us. I, I'm not sure how that happens, but it does. See, they look exactly alike. <laughs> this is, again, I'm shooting right into the sun. It's, uh, you know, 200 watt seconds. I'm just blowing the crap out of it, and it's uh, totally sharp. And you can even see the sharp, you can even see the building way in the background. That's how good my flash is. Huskies, man. 
these, these, don't they look exactly alike? <laughs> okay, wait, get ready. <gasps> I w he wasn't done with me petting him, so he awooed quite a bit. It was, it was pretty great. I do actually ask people to pick up their dogs a lot, mostly because I'm really tall and I don't, I'm tired of squatting down to take pictures close to the ground. So because it's my mental health day, I kind of feel like I should ask. <laughs> so I ask and then most people are really happy to do it. They're like, yeah, we pick them up all the time. I'm like, okay, great, yay. And then, and then it's nicer because you could get a little bit of the person with their dog and it, it's, a nice, it's a nice thing to shoot. I really like it. And you can see the lens flare. Like I'm just, you know, I'm very infat I'm infatuated with lens flare. And again, the flash you can even see in this file you can't really, but you could see his eyes through the sunglasses. Same here. You see the catch light in her eye? It's from the flash, obviously. Okay, get ready for this one. Julie loves this one. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and depending on the dog park, like I like to give a little bit of, ev of evidence of where we are, not necessarily telling, giving it away entirely, but you can obviously see that that's the top of the arch. So, um, and I, I think clues are very important. Like you'll always be able to know who this is. She'll always know who, she'll always know that that's her necklace. She'll always, you know, even if the dog and the person eventually fade away, there are clues that will indicate who the person is. And I, I like that. It's like uh, leaving a little bit of evidence, but not too much. His name was Pops, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> Okay, and then that's me, my website, my Instagram, and QR code to pre-order the book. That's all I got. <laughs> so for the family one, um, how did you start the project and like what part of the project or the shooting process mm -hmm. it made you to feel like it kind of showed ah, okay, you got it, got it. or like a reflection of your own family? Sure, sure. That's a very good question, very thoughtful. So the, the body of work, Glendalise, uh, I was living in that neighborhood. Uh, you know, you used to be able to afford an apartment in the East Village in the Lower East Side. If you wanted a cheap apartment, you lived in the alphabets. And I'm not kidding. Garbage strike, riots, tra I mean, it was unbelievable. So it was taken off the cost of the rent. The, location of the apartment kept the real estate price down. So at one point you could actually live someplace affordably and be an artist and that was where I lived and it was also a neighborhood where uh, it was very stratified because there were also families who lived in these unrenovated completely illegal tenements, cold water flats, that means they had no hot water, and families lived in them for generations. The building where I photographed, the family specifically, the mother with the daughters lived on the top floor. The father of the youngest girl lived below her and beneath them was the grandmother of the mother. And then there was an uncle and a cousin and that was the, that's how I grew up. I grew up in a multi-generational Mediterranean family and that was what I knew. So I, I was able to clock it culturally and it was familiar to me and it was something that I I think I needed to investigate. And you know, when you start shooting a project, you don't really know what you're doing. You don't go into it with a project summary written. Occasionally that is appropriate, but in this particular case it's not. So I was just going in and I was shooting and I was just saying goodbye to all my money and just buying film and applying for grants and getting some grant money and buying more film. and lather, rinse, repeat, and I did that for 10 years and eventually I got a body of work out of it. You know, the thing is pictures aren't supposed to sit in a box. Photographers would be quite content if they did, but then you have editors and publishers and 
curators and gallerists who then take the work and give it a life outside of the box. So that's, that's what happened. <laughs> Oh, I was just—I was just going to say, what period of what decade was so this? So, '90s to the to early 2000s, when you were shooting down on the East Village. Correct. Yep. By the 90s, it was already. It was changing. Yeah. It wasn't there yet. Hey, thanks so much. Love the wedding yeah. photos. <laughs> Thank you. Do people request that style specifically? Like, do they say we want documentary style or? Yeah, go for it. OK, <laughs> I don't pretend to be something I'm not. My work is all very clearly, transparently demonstrated before someone even calls me. So you can't just in the middle of your career just, like, you can't write with your right hand your whole life and switch to your left. It's probably possible, but it wouldn't be fun. So. I shoot the way I shoot, and if somebody wants to hire me to do that, then they're more than welcome to. And I will document their wedding exactly as my work would describe that I would. Um, it, I can count on one hand the number of stinkers I've had in a 20-year career. Just one hand. It's just my clients have been amazing, and they're wonderful, gracious people, and they want something that's a little got more bite, something more real. And I think one of the reasons I really like shooting weddings, I find it very enjoyable because, you know, when I look at like vintage wedding albums, like you go to an antique store, you look at your parents' album. My parents' album is all four by five and five by seven sheet film with a flash that looks like a magnesium flash. And they're all very kind of cinematic and caught and really lovely and that's sort of um, I would just say that's what I'm after that's the look I, I love and you know it's just how I shoot it I mean there's also kind of I have clients who don't want any formals I have clients who want formals formals are not an issue because it's just a an opportunity to put your lens in front of somebody's face and you know it's it's a cool thing to do so it's really more of a examination of a day because it's like a project, but you get one day. Yeah, <laughs> instead of 10 years. Hey, uh, thanks again. That was awesome. Hey, no problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my question is, it sounds like you have a, a cool working relationship with an agent. And I guess I was I no longer have an agent. You I no have longer a publisher have, now. OK, yeah. a publisher. I, I wouldn't guess, have an agent now if you paid me. <laughs> well, OK, <laughs> that's, I want to know more about that. I'd like to I, know. I can't speak to that. Everyone's different. Every agent is different. I'm personally done. I guess I guess I just mean like your um, relationship between being an independent creative person and then like navigating a marketplace. Um, I guess could you just speak to your experience in that? Uh, and any yeah, I'd be happy to. to so yeah. I'm an independent creative person who knows how to run a business. It's not rocket science. Buy low, sell high. You know, balance sheets and getting people to pay their bills and you know it's invoicing and if it's selling prints to a collection or a museum, it's, this, it's the same thing. It's the same type of um, endeavor because it's a business. And I, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was at, a, I collect, I have a collection as well, and I, I was at a gallery opening and someone said, well, how do you know so-and-so, the gallerist? I said, oh, well, I shop here. And she looked at me and she had this horrified look on her face. And the gallerist said, well, yeah, it's kind of a store. I'm like, well, yeah, it literally is a store. I give you money, you give me something. That's a store. Isn't that what a store is? Like, did I miss something in the fourth grade? That's what a store is. So I'm an artist, and I have a career, and it didn't happen overnight. I earned it, and I deserve it. I busted my butt, and I learned all the lessons the hard way, just like anybody else who starts a business. And, you know, that's, that's all there is to it. It's not very complicated. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> hey, uh, so to piggyback off of that question, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what for, would you like to know? For someone, uh, for creatives who don't have much experience with the business side of it, mm -hmm. do you have advice that you would give? Take a business class. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Take take a business class. But with I'm just somebody who's been in this professional sphere for however long you have. Um, outside of business, the, the relationship kind of between the artist and 
what areas of business you'd approach? Like what you talked about a I grant don't earlier. I question. Right, so you talked about a grant earlier. Yeah, you talked grant about applications are a big part of what I do. I can crank one out in a few days, depending on, depending on the grant. Yeah. So learning how to write grant applications is very important. Learning how to write a project summary is very important. Um, you know, grant money is taxable. It's, it's not free money. You have, to, you have to learn how to apply for that specific, like when you apply for a job and you have a resume, you're probably applying for a certain type of job, just like an artist who applies for a grant would apply for a certain type of grant. For example, I think Pollock Krasner, they just do painting. I think very rarely does Pollock Krasner give a photographer a consideration or an award. Um, but I think it does happen, but very, very rarely. And then there's a, there are grants where you can't apply. For example, I think uh, A Room of Her Own, I think is one you, you have to be secretly um, nominated and then they give you, you get a, a phone call or a letter and, and then they say you've been chosen for this grant. So that's another part of it. So building up that part of your career is important to, you know, you have to have a, um, a bit of a history and people have to know what you do. So that, that's another part of it. Uh, hi. Hi. I just have a little technical question. What would you like to know? So, the wedding stuff. Yeah. Were you shooting six by nine with that? Yeah. Are you still doing that? Do you shift? Yep. Sh no digital. I do. No, of course I shoot digital. But I mean, if someone wants uh, to buy a film package, I, I offer it. And has anything cha like changed for you since film digital? Do you care? Or do you just I, do whatever. I, whatever. <laughs> like, I don't really have a script I go by. I think um, a lot of the a lot of Shooting in any type of event is a lot of math. You have to know f-stops and ASA and guide numbers and watt seconds. And you have to do that in one part of your brain while the other part of your brain is looking for pictures. So it, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a lot going on. I don't talk a lot when I shoot a wedding. I get very over, uh, overheated. My brain just kind of, from all the math. <laughs> the next day, I feel like I've been hit by a bus. <laughs> I, I also have a technical question. Sure. Um, I might have heard this wrong, so correct me no, if no, I did. No. Did you say you made your own flash or modified yeah, your own I built, flash? I built my own flash system, sure. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because yeah, I don't hear that to. often. Well, what would you like to know? Well, what did you experiment with first, and how did you come around ah, to making okay, your it, own? Got it. So when I started shooting flash, I started with a, I don't know, a Vivitar 283 or a 285 or whatever they were making at the time. And I said, okay, well, this is good, but it's not strong enough or it's, I have to get it off higher on the bracket and um, the light's too, too, too close to the top of the lens. You know, things that you're shaping, you're shaping the light. And then I would move it to a bracket and then the bracket wasn't quite right and so I'd modify the bracket and then the flash wasn't quite right and then I'd modify the flash and then and so on and so on and so on until I have the contraption I have now. <laughs> That's great. I also have a question yeah. about like could you talk a little bit about your early career and advice to young creatives? Yeah, what would you and, like to know? Um, well, maybe a little bit more of your background, how'd you get into photography, and right. kind of some of your earliest projects. Okay, um, some of my earliest projects. Well, to Julie's point earlier, Julie was my first agent in New York, so you can harass her about the, the, that part of it. But I was working with Julie, and I was getting hired to shoot a lot of, um, as she said, famous faces. and. I'd get a call or an email, Angela, we need you to go to Texas at 3 o'clock, and I'd pack up my bag and go to the airport. And you know, I remember once we were shooting, <laughs> we got sent to shoot Julie Child and Jacques Pepin, and we were at their, her house in Boston. And the, they invited us to lunch. They invited us, Julia Child invited me to lunch. And there was no scenario in which I was going to miss that. But the editor was there, and the editor said, oh, we should leave them alone. And I said, your boss wants to say, you had lunch with Julia Child. You're going. And she said, OK. So we went to lunch with Julia Child and Jacques Pepin. And you know, I said, we'll get the next flight. There are shuttles from Boston every 45 minutes. What's the problem? So 
there was a bit of that. I just wanted to have lunch with Julia Child. Mm -hmm. And um, aside from photographing her, which was wonderful, it was just a, a singular experience. How do, you, how do you quantify that? I think about that job all the time. And I was very early in my career when I was doing that. So there are things that you just kind of go after because they're fun to you. And then there are things where you're like, eh, and you just sort of say no. And you should always be able to do that. If something's not very interesting for you, it could be interesting for any number of reasons. You could want to see what it looks like technically. You could try to want to shoot it. You could see what it's like to do that type of thing. And there's always value in that. However, comma, when you get more established and you start to learn more of what you like to do, you get to say no a little more often. Does that answer your question? It does. I'm Thank really glad. Of course. Okay, thank okay. you. <laughs>